In this video, we will be introducing the FOSS client software, which is included with the purchase of any Sensoron system. This software enables users to configure the system, start and stop data acquisition, visualize data in real time, and record data to file. Up to this point, users should have connected together the system, a sensor, and a Windows PC, as well as have powered on the system and configured their PC's IPv4 settings such that they may communicate. If any of these steps have not been completed, please refer to the videos which go over these initial steps. There are two applications which are needed to perform data acquisition, both of which are included with the purchase of a system. One application serves as the server and comes pre-installed on the Sensoron unit. The server software is also configured to automatically start when the Sensoron equipment is powered on. The second application is a client application. The client is provided on a USB drive and gets installed on any Windows PC that will be used with the system. What we are looking at now is the desktop of Windows PC, which has been connected to the Sensoron system via a wired network connection, and we have installed and opened the FOSS client software. So now coming over here to the FOS client window, we are going to start in the top left corner where it says server properties and IP address. So this is where you need to input the IP address of the Sensoron system. This can either be the static IP address that you have chosen, or it could be the dynamically set IP address that was chosen for the system upon connecting it to your organization's local network. So whatever it is, just input that IP address here. If you do not know what it is, then you can get it from the server software. The server software displays the IP address of the system upon opening it and you'll just need to either remotely connect to the system or use a mouse and keyboard uh, to see what that IP address is when it's displayed in the server software. Once you've input that here, just click the orange connect button. If it's successful, those two buttons here in the top left corner will turn green and this message saying TCP connect successful will be displayed. If it is not successful, there are three things that you can check. One is that you have correctly entered the IP address into the FOS client. Second is that you have a uh, working connection of the Windows PC and the sensor on system uh, to whatever network you're using, whether that's directly connected between the two or connecting them both to your local organization. Make sure they both see that network. And third is to double check the IPv4 settings such that they are configured correctly both on the Windows PC and the sensor on system. Uh, if you have not done so, please refer to some of the previous videos which go over those instructions. So assuming that's been done, we can then move on to the next section called Sweep Wavelength. The Sweep Wavelength section of the FOSS client software has two user inputs which need to be configured. These are the Start or Start Wavelength and Stop or Stop Wavelength values. These values set the dynamic range of the system, or in other words, the magnitude of strain or temperature changes that the system can measure, and they also set the sampling frequency. The closer together these values are, the lesser the dynamic range and the higher the sampling frequency. The extreme cases of this are maximizing the range, uh, which is setting the start wavelength to 1521 and the stop wavelength to 1564. And this provides plus or minus 17,000 microstrain and runs at about 9 hertz sampling frequency, or the opposite end of maximizing the sampling rate, which will yield the sampling rate of 100 hertz. Uh, and this is done by setting the start and stop wavelength such that they are 2 nanometers apart. Uh, and this will yield a strain range of plus or minus 900 microstrain. It's also important to note that the sensor fiber provided by Sensoron reflects a wavelength of 1546 in a state of zero strain at room temperature. If this value is not within the range set by the user, the system will not be able to make a measurement. So it's a good rule of thumb to keep the center wavelength, which is displayed below the start and stop values, uh, at 1546 and adjust the range symmetrically about this value, depending on the dynamic range required for a given test. Uh, this required dynamic range can be determined by knowing that one nanometer of range is equivalent to 830 microstrain, and that eight microstrain is roughly equivalent to one degree Celsius change in temperature. For this video, I've set the range to plus or minus 10 nanometers, about a center, wa uh, center wavelength value of 1546. And this gives me approximately plus or minus 8,000 microstrain uh, and a sampling frequency of about 18 Hertz. 
The next section in the FOSS client software is titled Fiber and has three user inputs. The first, called Gauge Factor, is simply the linear conversion factor between measured delta wavelength and mechanical strain. This is very analogous to the gauge factor seen with resistive strain gauges. By default, it's set to a calibrated value of 0 0.778. However, this uh, value is changeable if users wish to perform and apply their own calibration. The next input, uh, two inputs, are spatial resolution and sensing length. So the default configuration for the sensor on equipment is to uh, have a maximum sensing length of 13 meters. And the equipment is configured to discretize that available sensing length into uniform increments of a set spatial resolution. Those default spatial resolutions are 25.4 millimeters, 12.7 or 6.35, which also corresponds to one inch, half an inch, or quarter of an inch. And it will do so along the entire available 13 meter sensing length. The resolution is obviously changeable on the fly with just a simple drop down menu. I'm going to leave it at the lowest setting. There's also a spatial resolution up upgrade available to where you can change the sensing length. You can either have it or quarter it down from 13 from 13 meters down to 6.5 or three and a quarter meters. As, I can, as you can see, when I select this, the corresponding spatial resolutions will also be halved or quartered. So if you have an application where you have changing geometries, rivets, holes, uh, or other interesting features on your structure that may or may not create stress, uh, stress and strain concentrations or high gradients, the lower spatial resolution will help you resolve those um, distributions in a lot more detail. I'm going to leave it at the default setting of 13 meter sensing length and the 6.35 millimeter spatial resolution. Below the fiber settings is the mode control. This is where users can change the engineering units of the output of the sensor on equipment. By default, the system outputs data in terms of strain using this gauge factor as defined in the fiber section. By selecting the wavelength radio button, uh, the data will be output in terms of wavelength and users will then need to convert from wavelength to strain or temperature or any other engineering unit uh, using their own calibrations. And then the last option is RAW, which gives users access to the optical interferometric data for those familiar with OFDR techniques. I'm going to go back to the default strain, uh, strain option. The filter checkbox applies a spatial filter along the length of each fiber. Uh, the filter is called a median filter. So it's a sliding filter which acts along the length of each fiber where it looks, uh, for a given point, it looks three points to the left, three points to the right, and applies the median value to the point of interest, and it does so for every single point along the length. So it's essentially a smoothing filter, a spatial smoothing filter, and it's useful for removing localized noise outliers uh, in data. Uh, these outlier points can be caused by some installation faults. Uh, so when you install fiber optic sensors, for strain measurement, you tack the fiber in place using uh, spot glue techniques uh, before applying a continuous line of adhesive. At those spot glue locations, you can induce significant gradients if you apply tension between the tack points. That tension and high gradient between the tack points can cause local points of high noise, which is easily mitigated through the filter. Although it is important to note that using best installation practices, these points are easily avoided in the first place uh, and you can not have to use the filter. Centron recommends turning this filter off by default and only using it if it's absolutely necessary. The next section of the FOSS client software contains three buttons titled Start, Stop, and Tear All. Uh, these buttons are used for starting data acquisition, stopping data acquisition, and then tearing all or creating a new zero. I'm gonna go ahead and click the Start button now that all my other settings have been configured. It's going to initialize the hardware and begin data acquisition. When it's begun, the visualizer window will appear. In the top left corner, you will see an acquisitions counter indicating, uh, since it's incrementing upwards, indicating the data is being acquired. There's a buffer counter. This will only count up if data is being buffered at the server because it cannot be accepted fast enough on the client side. Uh, this should remain zero if you are using a wired connection. 
if you're using a wireless connection, depending on the available bandwidth, this buffer counter could begin to increment. Uh, Sensoron does not recommend the use of a wireless network for data transmission. Third, there is this acquisition, acquisition rate indicator uh, indicating that we are running at about 18.18 hertz. So in this visualizer window coming over to the top right corner, uh, there's a channel drop-down list. So we have four and eight channel systems available, and you can add and remove channels to this one single visualizer window. So I have a single sensor connected to channel three only on this RTS-125+, Plus, which is an eight channel system, which is why I have eight channels shown here. I'm gonna select channel three. You can change the color that the data is shown with by uh, clicking this color block and choosing a different color. I'm going to leave it as the default yellow. And you can add that channel to the window by clicking the add button. Data from this system and from all Centron systems is shown as a 2D or an XY plot along the X axis. Uh, it's labeled by sensors. This is the nth interval of your chosen spatial resolution. So we've chosen 6.35 millimeters. So this is essentially length by multiplying the X axis by 6.35 millimeters. The Y axis is strain in terms of micro strain. For this demonstration, I just have a very short sensor plugged in, which is why you see this very small, short, quiet section. The total available X axis represents the available 13 meter maximum sensing length, but you do not have to occupy that entire length with a sensor. You can use a subset of that length. So right now I have about a 20 or 30 centimeter sensor plugged in, which is why it's only occupying a very small subsection of the available sensing length. Over here on the far right, you can have some, uh, you have some manual controls to manually zoom in on the, both the X and Y axes. So if I wanted to zoom in on this section of the fiber, I could hover my mouse over the leftmost section. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner, it displays my current cursor position. So 427 and on the rightmost edge, 473. So I can come over here to the X axis control and enter those numbers. I'm going to keep the Y axis at plus or minus a thousand micro strain, hit the apply button. And now I'm zoomed in just where my fiber is located. If you wanted to stop the data acquisition, that's what the stop button is for. And then the tear button re-zeroes the data. So if I uh, say hung away from this beam and applied some strain, but I wanted that new state of strain to become my new zero state, I could then hit this tear all button and it will re-zero the strain output. The next section, which is titled record to binary file is where users can configure the recording settings for recording data to file. There's a folder input for choosing the default destination uh, where these files are recorded. Upon installation of the FOSS client, there's a default folder created called FOSS acquisitions and it's placed on the desktop. I'm gonna leave it there for now. Although users can change it to any file they wish by clicking this button next to the folder input with the three periods on it. Then we need to configure the recording settings. By clicking this settings button, it brings up an additional window called strain data channel settings. Now you can see we can change the settings for each channel. So we can set the system to record data for all channels or just a subset of channels or no channels. And you can change that uh, you can turn it on or off for a given channel by setting the start and stop both to zero. This will turn data recording off for this channel. The start and stop refer to the x-axis values along the available sensing length. So if I click all, it's going to record all zero to 2047 sensors available representing the entire 13 meter sensing length available for a given channel. For channel three, if we were to do this, most of that would be noise since I'm only using a 20 centimeter sensor. So in this case, I'm just going to isolate only where my sensor occupies that 13 meter length. So that's set by the start and stops that we had previously found 427 to 473. Now, when we record data, it's only gonna record for channel three and on channel three, it will only record sensors number 427 through 473, representing only my 20 centimeter long sensor. 
I'm going to hit OK. Now, if we were to click the record button, as long as it's recording until I click it again, it's going to record every single acquisition recording this section of only channel three. If users do not wish to record every single frame while it's being, uh, while it's recording data, there are some additional configurations that can be set using the second tab in the settings panel. So by default, it's continuous, which is set to record every single acquisition so long as you are choosing to record data. So you have to click this to start it and then click it to stop it and it's gonna record everything in between. The following radio buttons allow users to only record subsets in time, uh, the data that's being output. So there's a variety of options that can be played around with. There's a burst of X frames. So each time I click this button, I want it to record one or 10 or some other number of frames only once. You can tell it to record a burst of X frames every Y seconds. So for example, 60 frames every hour or 100 frames every day. Uh, that, those, those settings are all contained within these radio buttons uh, to record a subset of the data that's coming out of the system. The final section of the FOSS client software is titled Zero Frame Control. These controls give users the option to refer strain measurements to a previously taken zero strain state. Zero files are recorded for all channels every time the start or tear all buttons are pressed. And they are stored in the binary file recording destination. These files are tagged with a dash zero at the end of their name as seen here in the bottom right hand corner. Data files do not have the dash zero tag as shown by the data file taken from channel three previously. To reload a previous zero strain state, first select the channel from the channel drop-down menu. Then you click the select file button, which will bring up a prompt for you to select the DAS zero binary file, which represents the previously taken zero. Once it's selected, you then click the override button, and then all subsequent strain measurements will then be referred to that previously taken zero strain state. Clicking the stop button will end data acquisition. Clicking stop also deactivates the laser, leaving the system in an idle state. When not in use, the sensor on system may be left in this state or completely shut down. To shut the system down, click the file menu and then shut down server. This will prompt a confirmation. When the user clicks OK, a shutdown command is sent to the server, sending the server into a Windows shutdown procedure. At this point, the user should wait about four or five minutes and then they can toggle the power off or remove the power plug. For any additional questions, please reach out to the Sensoron Applications Engineering team by emailing info at sensoron.com.